Good afternoon. This is Uwe Rutenberg. Uh, Dr. Kate Hunter-Zaworski and myself uh, will present this project today entitled The Use of Mobility Devices on Paratransit Vehicles and Buses. I will start with the first half and Kate will present the second half. At the end of our presentation, we would like to hear from you what experiences you have regarding the issues we have identified. I would also like you to know that this project was done for situations in the U.S. Some of the issues may be the same in Canada, others may be different. Before I start the presentation, I would like to share some thoughts with you. We human beings are just one of the species living on this planet and unfortunately we're, we're not built to live in our environment, unlike many animals. Dolphins are built to swim in their environment, equipped with sonar to find food and detect enemies. Their shape allows them to move fast and efficient. Their skin and metabolism protects them against temperature changes. Birds are built to fly in their environment, fast, efficient, and graceful to find food and fly over long distances. Chameleons are built to adapt their appearance to any given environment for protection. We human beings are not built for our environment and we can do none of the above. We have barely achieved to walk on two feet, can swim a bit, but not fly, but we can sit, and for very long times. Despite of all this, we have one great advantage. It's called intelligence. When faced with challenges, we succeed to solve them. We invented clothing to protect us against the elements, shelters to live in, produce our own food, and transportation to move us from A to B. We invented cars, airplanes, buses, trains, taxis, and ships. Today, we're facing another challenge, much smaller but nevertheless important, to improve the access and safety of persons using oversized mobility devices to our transit systems. So let me give you a quick overview of our presentation today. Uh, first, the uh, project objective, then we'll show you different stages of the mobility a list of key stakeholders, the uh, research tools we used, uh, the identification of factors that impact the access to transit, finally issues, challenges, and suggestions, and eventually uh, going to your experiences in that field. The project, project of the objective was to improve the safety and level of service of public transport for larger and heavier occupied wheelchairs and scooters and paratransit vehicles and buses. This project was sponsored by the uh, Transit Cooperative Research Program, TCRP. Many of you probably know of the Transportation Research Board in Washington, D.C. Just want to make sure that this presentation reflects the views of the consultants and not necessarily those of the TCRP or the national academies. Uh, to identify some of the stages of the mobility, we have stage one where the person has a full mobility, convenience and independence. The person is able to walk, climb stairs, can use a car and public transport. In stage two, the person needs a wheeled mobility device and the person is partly dependent on that chair. Still able to walk a few steps, he or she can operate with a tiller or handlebar. There's a certain convenience for mobility for short distances, but the person is dependent on public transportation for long distances and intercity transportation. In stage three, the personal mobility is with use of an adaptive vehicle. That person is unable to walk, usually confined to a wheelchair and being able to drive the wheelchair in its own car. They have a large range for mobility with the vehicle, can make independent choices, 
and there is a certain level of convenience. In stage four, the person may be able to use a power chair. That person is fully dependent on the chair. The chair is operated by a joystick or similar devices. The convenient mobility range is for short distances and the person is dependent on public transportation for long distances. At the last stage, stage five, the person is totally dependent typically on a, a manual wheelchair. Uh, the occupant is unable to propel or operate the chair. It is, he or she is completely dependent on assistance for their mobility and also completely dependent on assistance for public transportation. This is the list of key stakeholders who were involved in the project. These are transit agencies, transit users, manufacturers of lifts and ramps, vehicle manufacturers, manufacturers of fare payment systems, securement manufacturers, and funding agencies. The research tools we used to compile the data were phone interviews, we had web and paper surveys, focus groups, and workshops. Here are the factors that we indicated which would impact the access to transit. The first one is demographics, second the transit user, the characteristics of the wheeled mobility device, vehicle layouts and constraints, transit operations, the transit equipment industry, and the regulators. This is a quick overview of the demographics as we found them in the U.S. Adults with physical functional difficulties, about 35 million or 16 percent of the population. Adults unable to walk a quarter mile, 60 million or 7 percent of the population. Obese persons estimated to be 42 percent in 2030. The last report from the U.S. Medical Association estimates that one in three Americans will be obese in the next decade. Adults with hearing problems, 34 million or 15 percent, and adults with vision problems, about 19 million, 86 percent. Some data that on demographics for Canada. Statistics in Canada in 2006 reported that we have about 4.3 million people over the age of 65. This will increase to 10 million by 2056. More than 10 percent have a physical disability, and of that, 72 percent, or roughly 300,000, have mobility challenges. Many of these people use wheelchairs, but the trend is to use three and four wheel mobility scooters. Why? We will come to this later. Our aging population consists of baby boomers who have financial resources, many who use scooters as a substitute for not being able to drive a car. It is predicted that the demand of scooters will increase into the next decade. The National Coalition of Vision Health indicated that we have about 278,000 persons who are visually impaired, about 108,000 who are legally blind, and these numbers are increasing. This is a cross-section of transit, transit users we identified. Uh, starting on the left, we have the passengers using manual wheelchairs, sports chairs, power chairs, scooters, and bariatric chairs. Bariatric chairs typically refer to wider chairs for people who are obese and heavier. Second picture shows the wheeled walker who can uh, be used with or without a seat. Then people on crutches and canes. And the last picture shows a person with a guide dog, a person who is blind. But we can also have service animals for persons who are deaf or hard of hearing. 
Here are some of the mobility device characteristics that we found. A typical manual sports chair uh, has a dimension of uh, 24 inches width by 48 inches long. Power chair about the same, can be a little bit wider. A three-wheel scooter still within the same kind of range, could be 30 inches wide, 48 inches long. Now we're coming to the oversized three-wheel uh, scooter, which can range from about 34 inches wide on 56 inches long or even longer. Standard four-wheel scooters can be 30 by 48, and the larger oversized four-wheel scooters, uh, which are increasing in demand, are about 30 inches wide and 60 inches long or even longer, which of course has an impact on the transit industry. Here are two pictures of non-transportable mobility devices. On the left you can see a large three-wheel scooter. These devices are coming more and more uh, onto the market, but are mainly used in outdoor environments. We can also see large four-wheel scooters, in this case here showing a canopy, uh, but other accessories can be added, so the length of the scooter is increasing significantly, uh, of course, creating problems for access. This is a, a quick comparison here on the mobility device length. Uh, on the top, uh, you see the standard reference wheelchair length, uh, which is about 48 inches. On the first line, you see this four-wheel scooter exceeding the four, 48 inches significantly could be 56 or even longer. Three-wheel scooters can be a little bit longer. We're talking about almost a standard scooter here. Uh, not the one before that I showed you is, is extremely uh, larger. And then we have the manual wheelchairs, power chairs, sport chairs. They're all within the range of 30 by 48. At this point, I would like to uh, change over to Kate. Uh, she will uh, continue with the presentation from here. Kate, please go ahead. Thank you. And good morning. I'd just like to mention that now we're moving from looking at the mobility aid and the user to our focus really around the vehicles. And one of the things that we discussed in our project was really looking at the environment for securement and judge, describing the securement environment in terms of the size of the vehicle, the mass of the vehicle, um, in terms of the requirements for uh, managing the forces. In the slide above, you see a 20G environment. That is the type of forces that a securement system must control. Generally, it's forward-facing, and we're looking at small vehicles, paratransit vehicles, under the gross vehicle weight of 13 thousand, let's say 14,000 kilograms. I do want to point out that there is a gray area as you transition in these weight zones. So 14,000 kilograms, you know, there may be some instances where it behaves more as a 3G than it does as a 20G, but these are sort of broad ranges that we use. A 3G environment would be what you would see on a large transit bus, a 40-foot bus. Uh, generally, you are in an environment where you can have rear-facing securement, side aisle containment. And then the what new one that we have proposed to study is really our 1G environment. These are your very large articulated rubber tired vehicles and generally these are the vehicles that you would see in a bus rapid transit type operations and service. And we propose that in this environment, you're looking at 1G, and this is really due to the nature of the ability of that vehicle to accelerate and decelerate. It's not directly related to the mass. It's really, in some ways, much more related to the transmission of the vehicle and also the ability of that vehicle to attenuate energy if there is any type of collision. And then within that, we have various securement systems that we look at. Next slide, please. Um, in these different environments. So in a 20G environment, which is our smaller vehicles, generally gas-powered, gas, -powered, gas uh, 
gas or diesel type transmissions, you have a slow, you have uh, the opportunity for much, much higher forces uh, for both in acceleration and deceleration. And the standard type of securement is your four belt wheelchair mobility device securement system with an occupant restraint system. And in almost all instances, you're looking at forward facing. The 3G environment, which you'll encounter on transit buses, fixed route operations, is generally rear facing with some sort of aisle side containment. And in this slide in the center here, you'll see that we have sort of what we call kind of the hockey stick. Uh, there are some issues with this and stanchion can often get in the way, uh, be a problem, but it does prevent the mobility aid from tipping over into the aisle. Another area we're exploring and uh, would like to look at for the future is a side facing. The picture you see in front of you is from a vehicle uh, either in Spain or Australia. You see it's a very large transit vehicle, but it uses side facing. Um, you'll also notice in this picture, though, that the user is using a manual chair hanging on, and it's not a particularly long chair, so it doesn't uh, invade the aisle, whereas a long scooter would actually block the aisle, and it may not be a feasible solution. So that brings us to looking at various vehicle layouts and the constraints that they propose. So this is just, in a sense, a generic high floor paratransit vehicle. It has a fairly limited seating capacity, limited weight. You'll notice that there are steps to enter the vehicle. The, uh, generally, with these types of vehicles, you'll often see that the wheelchair lift is located at the back, and the seating area is also located at the back. There are vehicles out there that are high floor, and they have their entrance right adjacent to the front door steps, the lift area, and the securement area is between the front and the rear axle. And this is something that we highly recommend because if you look at having the uh, wheelchair space behind the rear axle, people sitting in that position are exposed to uh, quite high vertical accelerations. And so if someone is already frail, it could be very much a problem. This is an example of what we're starting to see emerge on the market. Are, these are low floor paratransit vehicles. They have a flip ramp at the front, uh, generally a fairly generous vestibule that allows for large turning radiuses, which we see with scooters and things like that. And the wheelchair position, at least some of these, are located in front of the rear axle. You'll actually notice in this example there are two uh, seating areas behind the rear axle as well. But we really strongly suggest that if you're looking at uh, positioning of our more vulnerable passengers that the seating area be located between the front and the rear axles. Moving on to the slightly larger vehicles as we go up the spectrum, this is an example of a sort of fairly generic low floor transit bus. And the challenge with this type of bus is the turning radius that you will see at the front. The vestibule there is, um, turn radius is 36 inches. If you go and look at the turning radiuses on many scooters, you'll see that they are 38, 39 inches. And that's why in that bracket I put, oh, it would be nice to have 39 inches. And indeed, there are a couple of manufacturers that do have a very generous vestibule. I also note on this slide the fare box. And one thing we really try to encourage is that agencies look at providing a cantilever for the fare box so that you have much more space at the foot level rather than having a pedestal, which is really common, so that there's more area for people entering the vehicle. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do about getting between the wheel wells. 36 inches is generally the maximum. At that point, it's fine because most chairs really are at the most 32 inches wide. You'll occasionally get a large bariatric chair that's 34. That's very, very unusual. But generally, we're dealing with uh, mobility aids around the 30, 32 inch 
width at the most. And then you come on and you'll see on this particular example we have a rear, two rear facing securement systems and one, I'm assuming there's a flip seat there that also if somebody needed a forward facing uh, securement system that they would have that option as well. But you can see that there's fairly restricted maneuvering space for any of the mobility aids once they're on the vehicle. Moving on to looking at transit operations, there's a lot of uh, impacts that have to do with the accommodation of wheelchairs. Some of these things are obvious and some of them are a little bit less so. One is uh, an impact is the landing area for a wheelchair. If you have a road with a high camber on it or what we would call a cross slope on the road, the bus is already leaning it makes it very difficult to have a safe uh, deployment, particularly of some of the lifts. So it's very important that we look at when we're placing our bus stops, that we look at what is really happening to the road and what is the landing like. Can you have a safe landing for that person? We also uh, want to make sure that we don't impede the operation of the transit system, particularly for fixed route operations where adherence to a schedule is very important. So we want to design our vehicles to try to minimize the dwell time both for boarding and unboarding of mobility aids. At the same time we also want to be very careful about the level of involvement of the operator or the driver and this is particularly from a risk management perspective. We want to make sure that the lifts and ramps operate in a safe way so that the driver isn't having to get out and manually lift and move mobility aids. And I know that in many places they're not supposed to do this, but many of these drivers out of the kindness of their hearts actually do things that cause themselves injury. At the same time, the same is true for some of the securement systems really require that the driver become a Houdini in order to safely put on the straps and things like that. We want to make sure that our securement systems are designed in a way to really look at minimizing uh, the driver involvement and protecting the driver. The other challenge that we have in operations is the dilemma about providing extra seating capacity or for, for our passengers. At the same time, we're trying to say, well, we want more space. We want to be able to accommodate three and four wheelchairs on a vehicle. And the dilemma that we have of providing seating. And can we look at other ways to do that and say, well, we'll we will have um, seats around the edge of the vehicle, perimeter seating, and we'll have many passengers standing. But this really comes down to the philosophy of a particular transit agency and, what, and also the type of route that they're operating on. If you have a vehicle operating on a freeway at 55 miles per hour or more, it's probably prudent to make sure that all the passengers are seated. If you're running at uh, 15 miles per hour running speed in town, lots of stops, then it may be quite fine to have people standing. So it's really important to think about the operations. On fair collection can also be a barrier for access, with particularly if it's a pedestal type fair collection device. And with bus rapid transit operations, there's the opportunity for off-vehicle fare collection and getting rid of the fare devices on the vehicle altogether. And if that certainly will give you more opportunity for improving the vestibule access to the bus. So we've identified a number of issues, challenges, and have some suggestions. So we're going to talk a little bit about wheeled mobility devices, some transit operations, and I've alluded to those already, and then also talk about specific types of transit equipment to improve that. So wheeled mobility devices. Now I'm going to um, enter into a part of the presentation that I would say is going to put a number of controversial issues on the table and we're really, really hoping that these will tempt you to enter into a dialogue with us at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. So starting off, both feet forward, should oversized devices be transported on public transport vehicles? Well, 
research has shown that mobility aids over the years have gotten considerably larger. Um, particularly, they have gotten longer. And our research has shown that if we increase the footprint of a mobility aid to 54 inches long from the current 48 sort of standard, we will increase, be able to accommodate about 90% of the wheeled mobility devices that are currently on the market. You notice we haven't really changed the width, 30 inches, and still most mobility aids really are within that 30 inch uh, width. And that's partly because people, when they use these devices, want to go through doors, and doors haven't grown over the years. The other area that has changed, and that has to do with the changing demographics and the fact people are getting heavier, um, is moving from 600 pounds to 800 pounds. And I just want to apologize that these are in, uh, English units versus metric units, but I think most of us understand weight in terms of pounds. And you see that this is um, the combined weight of the occupant, and part of this is to do with the fact that the mobility aids themselves are getting much heavier. That's due to the batteries because we want to get longer and longer ranges out of these devices. And of course the occupants are also getting heavier. A new factor that we've introduced to really define a wheeled mobility device is the turning radius. And the reason is that we chose the turning radius, it's really a representation of the maneuverability of that device. So we know that there are powered wheelchairs that have a fairly large footprint, but due to the configuration of the wheels, they are very nimble. And they can turn in really what they are themselves with small turning radiuses. At the same time, we know that there are four-wheel scooters that may only be 48 inches long, but they have very large turning radiuses. And that's really independent of the proficiency of the operator. The other controversial topic that we want to talk about is making sure that on all wheeled mobility devices that are considered for transport, that there are attachment points for particularly the four belt securement system. And that these attachment areas are located at structurally safe areas on these devices and frames. And we strongly recommend that scooters have securement system attachment areas if they are to be transported on public vehicles. And one of the dilemmas that comes up is you'll see that many times people are say, well, you can take your scooter on a paratransit vehicle, but you have to transfer to the seat. And what does that leave? Well, that leaves a scooter. How are you going to secure that scooter? So this issue with scooters, paratransit vehicles, occupied and unoccupied, it is it is a significant issue and it also poses a strong dilemma. And you also, for many of you know, that there are really very few places where you can safely attach any type of securement system to stop these devices moving, whether they're occupied or not. Moving on to looking at some transit operations. Large vehicles, what we really would like to do is trying to minimize the impact on operations by reducing the dwell time. This can be accommodated if you're using center boarding um, for the, the chairs. And this is very common, again, on bus rapid transit. You have level boarding. You have often rear, and you may even have side facing as the traveling position. For smaller vehicles, making an effort to locate the wheelchair positions in between the front and the rear axle. Uh, trying to use low floor vehicles for all, all our vehicles because that really benefits all. Many of the uh, passengers who are using paratransit vehicles actually are using walkers. And one of the barriers for them is just simply getting up the stairs. Also a consideration both for large and small vehicles is accommodating space for service animals. A number of people who use powered wheelchairs have service animals as, um, to help them move move around their communities. It's also very important if you are conveying um, information that it's conveyed in two modes. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. Uh, this is somewhat a, not directly related to the problem of oversized wheelchairs, but it is very important to make sure that opera, uh, travel information is in both audio and visual format. It's real time, and then it's in an area where someone sitting in a wheelchair is able to read the uh, text and also to hear the message. Also, one thing we've discovered is that there are many places that uh, do some training, um, but they don't do recurrent training for their operators. And it's important that particularly in areas where a lift may not be used that frequently, that an operator uh, gets recurrent training. Also, it really helps um, if they get to practice, they get to when they're doing their training, they're not just sitting watching a video, but they're actually doing hands-on. And we've also noticed that a number of agencies that engage travelers with disabilities, part of the training program, um, it's a win-win for all because the operators get to meet who they're going to be helping, and the uh, people with disabilities get to have some sort of introduction to their operators. And so that also can be uh, very, very helpful. Moving on to looking at the industry, we have been uh, working with a number of the manufacturers of transit equipment. And the lift and ramp manufacturers, for the most part, they're already designing and, and uh, manufacturing and selling the higher lifted, uh, the higher rated lifts and ramps. Uh, some are actually selling 1,000 pound uh, rated ramps, but we're seeing that the industry is already moving to the much heavier ramps. Uh, we're also seeing that the industry has not waited for a change in regulations. They're already uh, manufacturing ramps are on the 54, 56 inch platform size because they've already seen a change and many of the agencies are saying, you know, to accommodate our particular population, we would like to have the larger uh, ramps. We're also seeing that some of the seating manufacturers, seats currently in the U.S. are designed for a 450 pound vertical load. We do know that there's one manufacturer that is selling a single flip seat that's rated for a much higher vertical load. The challenge of uh, making seats to accommodate larger passengers is uh, that they can impact the aisle width and they may reduce the overall seating capacity of the vehicle. So it really gets back to that dilemma about uh, how many people are we going to accommodate by sitting. The fare payment, we're seeing a lot of changes in the fare payment world. We're seeing a move towards smart fare payment systems, cashless systems. Uh, some places they don't even have fare boxes. In other places they're moving the fare box completely off the vehicle altogether. 